Hello, welcome to lecture 11 for communication 1110. This is a continuation of lecture 10 where we talked about the demographic characteristics of the audience. Now we're going to look at the psychographic or the psychological characteristics of the audience. And in doing that, there are many ways we could, but we're going to look at four what are called often hypothetical constructs because they, we believe they exist but we can't see them with a microscope or a CAT scan. And they are called belief, attitude, values, and needs. And you hear these words quite a bit, but sometimes the way they are used in popular culture or just everyday language really doesn't fit the um, the way that it's used in a more social sciences context. So that's how we're going to look at it today. The first one is belief. To define belief, I would say that is uh, what we hold to be true. Now I didn't say that it's true, I said it's what we hold to be true. And of course, every individual person has his or her different beliefs. But it's what we hold to be true, and because of that, beliefs form the foundation of a lot of what we do and, and other things that we think. Beliefs are considered to be in the cognitive domain, which means the thinking or the intellectual processing side of the brain. And what's interesting is where beliefs come from, and this is a very important part of this, because you can't really change a belief unless you know where it came from in the first place. We hold the beliefs we have either because we experienced it, uh, we saw it, we felt it, we went through it, or the other source of belief is someone we trust, an authority, a religious text, a, um, a, a leader, a teacher told us. And our trust forms the, uh, in that person forms the belief. Obviously, if it's from experience, that's going to be uh, changed differently than if it comes from an authority. Uh, for example, it, uh, a few years ago, my husband decided that we were all going to be uh, start skiing, snow skiing. And if you had asked me prior to that Christmas morning that he gave us skis <laughs> for, for Christmas, if, uh, if I could ski, I would have said no. I don't believe I could learn to ski. But given this gift and his persuasive personality, I started skiing. And after a while, I did learn to ski. So my experience changed my belief, as well as my, my self-concept in a sense. Whereas other beliefs we have because of authorities. Now, I want to stop here and talk about some characteristics of belief that also were going to be true about the values and the, the attitudes as well. The first characteristic of belief is centrality, centrality. How important is it, how central is it to your self-concept, to who you are, your identity? So that's one. Some beliefs are very central to who we are. Others are sort of, like I say, out in the parking lot there. We have beliefs about them, but they're not that important. Another is the stability of the belief. And stability comes from how long we've held it. You've heard all your life the old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, you can, but the, what that's saying is that if, the longer a person holds a belief, uh, the harder it is to change, and, th and that is true. And then the third characteristic is salience, and that's spelled S-A-L-I-E-N-C-E. -E. And that's a word that means it's, an, it's sort of in the front of your thinking. You think about it a lot. It's, it occupies a big part in your, your everyday life. And so you can see that, again, some beliefs are going to be more salient. You think about them every day, whereas others, you may not think about them as much. And this is going to be different for different people. So the question becomes, uh, when we get to persuasion, how do you change a belief? Well, since the sources of belief are authority or experience, then you either have to provide new authorities or you have to provide new experiences. Now obviously for a speech, providing new authorities, new evidence, etc., is going to be easier than new experiences, although sometimes you can do that as well. The second uh, psychographic characteristic that we're going to look at is attitude. 
First of all, what is the definition of attitude in this context? First, it's not mood. We often say, oh, she's got a bad attitude today. That's not a social sciences definition of, of attitude. Attitude is a predisposition to respond in a certain way to an object, a person, or an idea. Okay. Now, the word predisposition means it has a sense of stability in it. It's not going to change from day to day. Now, your attitudes may change over time, a long period of time, but they will not change from day to day. If you didn't like tuna fish sandwiches yesterday, you're not going to love them today. Okay, that's a silly example, but uh, you could apply that to any number of issues. You have an attitude about uh, Congress, an attitude about the president, an attitude about the college. You have attitudes about everything. It's a predisposition to respond positively or negatively to an idea, an object, or a person. Okay, The sources of attitudes are very complex, so I'm not going to get into that here. Uh, whereas in belief it's very simple, in attitudes it's not. A lot of things contribute to your attitudes. Attitudes are, because you're responding positively or negatively, are in the affective, or more what we would call the emotional domain, whereas beliefs are in the cognitive. And the reason we study attitude, and it is the most studied concept in communication, and persuasive uh, communication especially, is that attitude is the most direct link to what we do. Interestingly enough, belief is not the most direct link to what we do. We have a lot of beliefs that we don't follow through on, but we do follow through on our attitudes. And that's something that's a uh, reason that we want to know what the attitudes are of the audience. The most important attitude of your audience is what Aristotle called ethos. That's E-T-H-O-S. And what does that mean? Well, the common definition for ethos is credibility. Does the audience trust you? Do they have an attitude of trust in and credibility in the speaker? And that, obviously, you can see is very important. Because who wants to listen to you if they don't trust you? And the uh, one thing you have to think about here is that credibility is not something the speaker has. I don't own credibility. It's in the minds, the attitudes of the audience toward the speaker. So that's going to influence the way you look at it. There are five factors that contribute to source credibility. The first one is competence. Is this person smart? Is the speaker, the source of communication, uh, credentialed, knowledgeable? Are they experienced? Do they, have they done what they've ta they're talking about? And also, are they competent as a communicator? We've all had doctors who were very smart. They had all the diplomas on the wall, but they couldn't communicate. And that's, you know, that's important too. So competence as a communicator as well as a credentialed, experienced person. The second factor of source credibility is character or trustworthiness. Does this person walk the talk and talk the walk? Are they consistent or are they inconsistent in their lives? They preach one thing, so to speak, and practice another. We often say it that way. We want to see that consistency in people. How did they make their money? How do they spend their money? For example, Oprah is considered very credible by many people because not only did she earn her money honestly, she's very, very generous in what she does with her money. The third factor that uh, contributes to source credibility is sincerity or goodwill. And of course, this is perceived. Does the audience perceive you as having their, their interests in mind, as having goodwill toward you? And for example, Walmart will do a lot of things in the community so that people feel that Walmart is, uh, has sincerity towards the community because, as you know, Walmart has had many uh, instances where people were critical of them for hurting local economies. The fourth factor that contributes to source credibility is an interesting one. It's called dynamism, like the word dynamite, and it means physical and social attractiveness. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Physical attractiveness does influence credibility. I wish it didn't, but it did. We've all heard those stories about how 
if uh, two people go for a job interview, they'll do a test, and, and one of them's kind of homely and the other's very nice looking, they have the same cre credentials, the good looking person will probably get the job. And I'm not saying that's right, I'm just saying that it happens, especially for jobs that are dealing with the public. So there is, there is some sense that good looking people have initial credibility that's very high. Unfortunately, there's some downsides to that. One is that they are also seen as more promiscuous, which is kind of odd, and that it only works in certain situations. For example, this is the example I often give. Let's say you're a guy and a really nice looking girl walks up to you on campus and says, hi, would you sign our petition? And you say, well, what's the petition for? And she says, well, we want to get more vegetarian options in the campus cafe. And since you don't, care and she's cute and you'd like to get to know her better, you'll see sure, I'll sign the, the, the petition. Because it's not a big commitment for you. It's not something that's really important to you. However, let's say you are very uh, pro-life and somebody comes up to you and she's cute and she says, hi, would you sign our petition? And you say, what's it about? And she says, we want to have a pro-choice rally on campus. It wouldn't matter what she looked like, you probably would say no because that's very important to you. And I picked that as kind of an extreme example, but that's why advertising for beer and that kind of thing uses good looking girls in swimsuits, whereas uh, investments use old men who look wise and, um, and competent. So that's the, the, the difference there. The other type of dynamism is social attractiveness, and that's one we can all have. Social attractiveness comes from usually your personal energy and your nonverbal communication. Can you look at people? Can you shake their hand? Can you look them in the eye? Can you talk? Put sentences together? Those kinds of things. And you'll find that most politicians are very, very high. Watch President Obama when he's in a crowd. Oh, social dyna dynamism all over the place. Social attractiveness. Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan, they could just absolutely take over a room and make you think you were the most important person in the world. So that's, they have a lot of um, social attractiveness. The last and probably the most important factor of credibility is similarity. We trust people who are like us. Now whether we should or not, that's not the point, but we do trust people who are like us, who share our values, our backgrounds, our beliefs, our goals, that kind of thing. There are three important lessons about credibility's effect from, that's uh, been found from the research. And again, this is a very researched subject. Credibility must be supported by the other two types of persuasion, which is logic and emotion. You can't just tell people, trust me, but not give them anything else to back that up in a speech. So don't just depend on your credibility. Secondly, credibility must be cultivated. Cultivated is like if you have a garden, you go out, you have to dig, pull up the weeds, put fertilizer, etc. You have to cultivate, work on your credibility. If you are, excuse this expression, but if you act like a real jerk in class, when you get up to speak, nobody's going to want to listen to you. The relationships you develop before and after your speech are as important as the speech. So it has to be cultivated. And the last thing about credibility is that it is fluid. It, it's going to change from time to time and from audience to audience. And you see this with opinion polls, for example, which opinions and attitudes are pretty much the same thing. The president may be very popular at one point and people approve of him and then later, a few months, uh, that's changed. With one group, he's very has a lot of credibility. With another, he does not. So, um, credibility is a very fluid kind of concept. Moving on to the third uh, psychographic characteristic, that's values. Values are ultimate goals we strive for, and they are abstract. A house is not a value. What the house represents when you buy it is a value. It could represent independence, security, status, creativity, family, etc. Those are values. The house is not a value and people get this confused. Another thing they get confused about values is they, you'll hear the expression values voters. Everybody is a values voter. 
Okay, I want that to be clear. Not just conservatives, not just progressives. Everybody votes his or her values. So when we go there, we into the voting booth, we think what's important to us? What do we strive for? And that's what values are about. In our country, there are a lot of competing values, and all those competing values inform political debate. I'll give you two. Uh, one is change, and the other is tradition and history. Now, what we call these are progressive versus conservative, but some people value change and some people value the past. Another one is community versus autonomy. Some people value, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. That's autonomy whereas others value community. We're all in this together and we have to make sacrifices. You can see how that would inform something like the health care debate. So uh, values are very important to a lot of what we do. You need to know what's important and the ultimate goals of your audience. The last psychographic characteristic is uh, needs. And the most common way of looking at needs, one that a lot of you are familiar with, is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And you know that that's the pyramid. At the bottom you have physiological needs. The next level up is safety and security. The next level up on the pyramid is love and belonging. The next level up is esteem needs, uh, or achievement needs, some people call it. And then the last one is self-actualization. Maslow's theory is that if you don't have the lowest pyramid uh, level of the pyramid met, you will not operate in the next realm. And if you don't have that one met, you won't operate in the next realm. And he got this from child development. As, as a child grows, it, it operate, um, its development goes that way. He, uh, he also does not believe in a spiritual component, so that's, you know, every, everything is physical. Um, and so some people may have a problem with that. The interesting thing about uh, Maslow to me is that I think the United States we're all culturally at the second level. We have our physiological needs met, but we do not feel safe and secure. And so it seems like we're stuck there. A lot of advertising, a lot of products, a lot of industries are based on the safety and security. So we've looked at Belief, attitudes, needs, and values. These are very important no matter what you're speaking about. They're, it will be particularly important when you go to the persuasive speech.